hello, hello, and thank you for checking out The Latrell Show, building businesses, bars, and brands. This episode, I'm so pleased to welcome a good friend, a sounding board, an idea factory, and general mechanic. And when I say mechanic, I mean somebody who really knows how to build engines and create efficient systems. Chris is the founder of Bar Methods, which is a bar technique training school. The applications are open right now. And he's the operations consultant for Liquor Lab. So he and I have gone back and forth together for years about particular operational conundrums or like techniques. Um, I think he's the one who first turned me on to AppSumo. But um, Chris is one of my favorite people and I'm so excited to introduce a cocktail consultant and operations consultant, Mr. Chris Bidbean. Hey Chris, how you doing? Jason, doing well buddy, how about yourself? Good, thank you. Uh, definitely picked a week to, to record this when I have like a radio voice because I'm still a little bit sick. But um, Welcome back from Vietnam. Uh, that sounds like an amazing trip. It was absolutely incredible. I uh, definitely recommend it to anybody who has an opportunity to get out there or just anywhere near it. It was so nice and it was so much culture shock and just so great to see something so different. That's so cool. It's so cool that you took the time off to do that. Um, and this came from getting a flight credit from giving up your seat on a flight one time. And that got you most of the way there, right? A hundred percent. It was uh, an oversold flight, volunteered my seat up. It covered about 85% of the cost of the ticket. And I forced myself to use it on something not work related. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of that, I mean, how much of what percentage of your work is freelance? It's all freelance, right? Or like, so you were involved with bar methods, uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're producing bar methods. It's your brainchild. Um, you also work extensively with Liquor Lab. What's that all about? Yeah, definitely. I mean, bar methods is my baby through and through. Um, and then when it comes to Liquor Lab, I am on the operations side there. I used to host a bunch of the classes and do the educational side of things. But now with the expansions coming up, so much more of my role there has shifted into the op side of things, the SOP development um, actually getting the, you know, the structure and the workflow together to be able to take on and sustain this expansion. We're already in New York and Nashville. We're currently working on building out locations in Louisville and Denver. And then we've got expansions beyond that in Atlanta and potentially Vegas, I believe, by the end of the year. So it is really, really an aggressive opening schedule. And a lot of my job now is shifting into just developing the SOP and the recipes and the forms and the workflow for each location as they open to not only physically open the location, but train up the staff and have them tasked out and, you know, efficiently operating with as short of an on-ramp as possible. Yeah, you are spe like especially gifted at this. Um, I've We've worked together on so many different projects, uh, like Made in America. We've worked on Miracle. We've worked on the Campari Academy together for a little bit. Um, you have a gift, sir, uh, and it is in organizational methodology and it is in scaling. Um, so tell us, how do you uh, how do you manage the operations of, um, of Liquor Lab and what tools do you use for that? Um, well, and this is a heavy, heavy callback to your earlier episodes. Um, and this is definitely coming from the brainchilds of working with you, but AppSumo has been an invaluable resource as far as finding systems and programs to kind of help facilitate a lot of what we're putting in place. Um, Trello and Slack, as far as internal communication and organization, has been massive. Um, we've even gotten it to the point now where organizationally, as we're keeping the calendar, we've actually built out our own custom calendar in Trello to manage our workflow for our public bookings, our private bookings, uh, pretty much everything short of our staffing, we run the schedule through a Trello board that just kind of emulates a calendar. And then through power-ups and stuff like that feeds into Google Calendar. Uh, and we're actually also working on our own custom platform to manage the day-on-day -day productivity, production, uh, the scale for the events, and all that kind of helps just keep the prep schedule and production and labor hours down as low as possible. What, do you have anything to say to anybody who's still working on like one spreadsheet at a time or worse, a pen and paper? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, do, they, do they still exist is my question. I mean, I, I know they still exist because I was that stubborn asshole up and until, you know, a couple of years ago. And I know there are people that are fixed in their ways and people that swear that they do it better and this works best for them. And 
if that's the case, great. If you're, you know, if you've built your room and you've locked the door and you're sitting inside of it and that's all you're doing and you figured it out, good on you. Um, for everybody else who's actively dealing with the variable change of day to day, um, there are smarter people that are designing things that have the potential to be more efficient and be more flexible and be more scalable. Um, they're not, I've yet to find any one system that's perfect or any one system that is all encompassing, but I've definitely managed to find a suite of different programs and systems and things to use, um, and kind of layer those one over the other and integrate one with the other, uh, just in my own workflow and in the workflow of, you know, what we need and what I've needed based on the projects, you know, when we were working on miracle versus when we're working on made in America versus liquor lab versus bar methods, um, the systems definitely modify. There's some, you know, there's some consistency between the platforms that I use and the systems and programs that I integrate, but it's definitely looking at what problems I need to solve based on what it is. And then looking at what programs are available to do that. And sometimes the answer is a spreadsheet because it's a simple task. Other times, you know, there are platforms and softwares out there that are either available for free that are available for, you know, an early, 50 bucks. Yeah. For a real Forever. early on a subscription to it. Or sometimes it's worth the five ninety nine a month for the year to really just save the labor hours of sitting there and trying to update lines of code or God forbid, like my formula three sheets deep goes off or someone touches a cell they shouldn't have. And now I've got to spend more time rebuilding the worksheet and figuring out where it went off than, you know, than doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And now I'm already behind the eight ball. So yeah, well, you got to protect You got to protect that range player. That's it. <laughs> you got to make sure that they can't touch it. <laughs> I mean, I've always looked up to you for these kind of things because I'm pretty sure you're the one who turned me on to AppSumo. And that is probably the single number one, um, first of all, line, it, line item expense for my company because I buy pretty much everything. And two, it has opened my opened up my eyes to a whole world of integrations and and things that you know software automations that that are just not very popular that people just don't know exists. But there's some nerd somewhere. There's sometimes there's even these little one person companies that are just coding day and night for weeks um, and come out with a software product and it solves this particular problem that integrates with another thing that solves that problem. Next thing you know, a job is being eliminated. Um, so it's like even five, 10 years ago, guys like you and me wouldn't be able to operate these things without a team of people to kind of push paper around and to like solve problems individually and independently. Just very grateful you turned me on to that because I'm not sure if I would have uh, ever gotten into AppSumo, but now it's an obsession and I hate you for it. Ha, you're very welcome. And for everybody who's in there chanting sumo lings, just remember that he learned it. <laughs> Five tacos. <laughs> um, <laughs> So okay, so let's let's move on to methods. So methods is um, is your brainchild. It's something you developed. This is what the fourth or fifth year. We are going into our fifth, fifth year. year. Okay, and so you came up with an idea that that identified a gap in the market as far as training was concerned. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, they're working from an experiential agency side, having so many people and friends and experience in the industry. There's there is a big gap a few years ago and you know we're doing our best to close it but the issue is you had your you know your acme bartending schools your 101 stuff where they pretty much brought you in they taught you 50 cocktails what side of the bottle the liquor poured out of and they guarantee you work placement then you have your other side of things um which are your master classes your you know your accelerated programs your 500 spirit tasting rooms that do a great job for everybody kind of at the top end of their career and you know those master level educations but there was a big void in the space of getting between the two and a lot of it came because the market has blown up so quickly you know the craft cocktail scene the restaurant industry you know, the hospitality industry as a whole has expanded so fast that we haven't had the opportunity to really develop people into those leadership positions. And that mentorship and that growth structure that used to be there of, 
you know, the senior bartender bringing up the bar back so that they can work Mondays from Mondays. They move to Thursdays from Thursdays. They Mm -hmm. take a Friday, Saturday shift. A lot of that has kind of gone the way of the Dodo where now you've got one person who's capable of leading a program whose favorite catchphrase is I'm working on this project, but I can't talk about it right now. And they're going in, they're onboarding, they're laying in some base programs and opening menu. They're training the opening staff. And the minute the ball is rolling, they're out the door on the next project because they're already backlogged in tasks that they've got to do. So you have these people that come in and they're in place, but there's no one above them to help elevate and to help educate, and bring up the people around them. So, I wanted to develop a program that put out credible information and put out, you know, knowledgeable peers that can go back and share this knowledge with the people next to them and really just qualify the information that they're learning more so than hoping that they decipher a book the right way or hoping that they clicked on the right YouTube video to learn from. You know, it gave us an opportunity to open up a platform where we've got industry leading people we've got you know top bodies in their field teaching them technique that they specialize in so that when they go back to their bars and their teams and their restaurants they've gotten validated good tested knowledge and it's a small enough class where you're not just kind of being talked at yeah but you're able to get hands on, you're able to work with the instructors. We're able to make sure that what you're learning and how you're learning it is really, you know, done in a way that we're guaranteeing you're going home with the information and with the knowledge taught to you correctly. One thing that that I always thought was really interesting about bar methods specifically was not only was it technique focused and, um, uh, and, and very community oriented, but also, um, it's not the good old boys club. It's not just like the top 50 bars in any particular market. Uh, it seems like you appeal to an audience that's, um, in the secondary tertiary markets, like they, the people come from all over the place. And it's not just the top tier accounts. And I, I, I feel like a lot of times they specifically target um, educational opportunities towards you know top performing accounts or prestige accounts. Whereas it's a 100% application based, uh, people have to actually make a deposit to, um, to ensure and guarantee that they're going to show up. Um, and then, uh, and then it's, it's all very much real life, practical application, you know, knowledge. Uh, I think that's just wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And that's a hundred percent. It's fully application based. We've gotten so lucky in being able to put together a platform and just kind of carve out a niche where we're finding the nerds that are out there. We're getting the bodies that are signing up that are actively pursuing knowledge actively pursuing expanding their career they're in a market that's blowing up you know it would be it would definitely be much easier for me to just focus in on the top 50 national accounts the top 50 new york accounts it would be a much easier sell to the brands for me to focus in that way Uh, but it really would be doing you know it would be doing bar methods a disservice it would be doing the reason that i set out to do this a disservice because there are so many other markets that are up and coming. There are so many people that are up and coming in these smaller markets, secondary, tertiary. I mean, I was I was really taken aback last year to have two people from Kalamazoo, which prior to last year, I would only say that sarcastically, but I had two amazing operators come out who were opening an establishment out there that came out to make sure that what they were doing was in line with the current standards that who they were going to be training up and teaching and bringing on board and, you know, onboarding their staff the correct way with the right knowledge. Um, It's really incredible to see what's there. And the biggest takeaway that I've had from it is the smaller markets care, you know, the people that are hungry and looking and going after this information care. They're still thirsty for it. If you look at New York and, you know, I love living here, but it's tough to find it's tough to find people with the bandwidth to even take on more because so often they're so busy. I mean, we've really found that the applications coming in are coming from, you know, bigger secondary markets, tertiary markets, where a lot of the chefs and restaurants and groups are starting to go down to and open up new venues and new properties and new outlets. Well, 
you know, people talk in terms of how busy they are and, and that they're just crushed and slammed. And, you know, you got to think about like, what do you want to say on your tombstone? You know, like, do you want to say that you were busy all the time or do you want to say that you were like present when it mattered that you, you know, explored opportunities that were worth it? And when people say that I'm just too busy for this, what they're really saying is that that's not a priority for me. And that's yeah, fine. Sure. Uh, um, and it's like, you know, and bless their hearts for that. That's fine. Um, you know, I remember when I was running around New York as a, as a bartender, I took a lot of educational opportunity. I took a lot of opportunities for granted. Um, uh, but I'm just glad that you're, you know, connecting the dots and like really connecting to people who are interested, like interested, who are uh, motivated to give them what they need and, um, and big ups to the brands that support that. I had a question for you about, um, you know, your, your applications are open right now. Uh, how long are they open for? Uh, we're having them open for 30 days. So there's about 24 days left on them. So what do you look for in an application? Um, our applications are actually pretty simple. Uh, there's a lot of ways and there's a lot of opportunity for, you know, elegant applications that require lots of words to sell yourself. And that's not what I want. Um, I actually take the time to comb through every application, go through all the social media links that are attached and really make sure that the people who are attending are in this for the long haul. You know, it's something that they represent in their everyday life. Um, it's not just someone who is eloquent when it comes to writing a paragraph. It's, you know, it's going to actively be shown in your social media. It's going to actively be shown in your engagement um, in what you're tagged in, you know, if this is something that you're looking to do for a living, it's going to be out there. Um, and then even beyond that, like I've hopped on the phone with people and said, Hey, what's going on? You know, tell me about yourself. But I really do take a point of pride in actually going through every application and digging beyond just the words in there. Mm -hmm. And it's in large part why we keep it so simple. Like anybody who's sitting there waiting for the time to fill this thing out, stop waiting. It'll take you three and a half minutes. And it's literally your name, where you work, how long you've been there. What do you do? Give me your social media accounts. And, you know, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And also, and you use a, what, a Google form for that? Uh, yeah. So it's, we host up the website on Squarespace and then that actually integrates directly with Google forms. So everything just gets populated into a spreadsheet. I have all the data laid out in front of me, nice and easy. And then, uh, you know, I've got a couple of things beyond that for our uh, our ticketing system and, you know, a little bit of our workflow for the onboarding once everybody's accepted. But uh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty easy process. And, you know, after five years of doing this, we've kind of boiled it down to the easiest, most hands-off way as far as the actual process goes on the backside of things so that we can take the time and actually go through the applications and we're not spending it just moving paperwork around and you know, highlighting columns and building spreadsheets. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like all that kind of stuff. Um, I just really feel like people don't know it can be, most of it can be automated, you know, speaking of like the engagement rates and stuff like that. And as, if things go into a Google form, uh, you can actually, there's actually a formula that you can use to extract the engagement rate, follower count, all that stuff. It's called index reg extract. Um, and, uh, there's some wild information that you can get and you can actually even port that information into other things if you want it. Yeah. hundred percent. It's actually why I ask for the full URL and not just your at handle. Yeah. Um, so that I can use that format and it just carries right into the spreadsheet. Right. And then you just copy and paste it all the way down and then you have everybody's information at a glance. Um, uh, but, but like the hardcore digital marketers, they, they have just really, really wacky stuff with spreadsheets. I'm getting kind of into some other stuff like right now with, with my BEO and trying to get my, uh, getting costing down and stuff like that. Um, but uh, there's just some wildly powerful things that you can do with Google Sheets that I just don't think that, I think we maybe even use less than 1% of um, when, we, when we use that tool. Oh, a thousand percent. And if anybody from Google's listening, I would love to host a class because, and Jimmy Palumbo from Heaven Hill did a great job years back when he was managing bars of really opening my eyes to the power that is within this with it being hosted on the web. Mm -hmm. There are so many integrations that you can pull in from different feeds and different websites to actually like really, really draw some information through and get a lot more data on there than you could in Excel or anything standalone. No doubt. Um, I'm actually giving a chat on this um, at ICE later this month. So I'm kind of boning up on my Excel skills. I, uh, I primarily use Google, Google sheets and Google drive, but, um, I could dust off my, my, my Excel skills. But if the, to your point, I mean, it's like, you can put stuff on one spreadsheet, 
that takes information from another source, like a form or something like that. And then you can draw that information as live data via like import range function. And that becomes the new information. So you can like have one sheet that everybody draws from that has like the cost of a lemon, a lime wheel, whatever uh, in a particular region, and then import that into your BEO using this one function and then cost out specifically on the seasonal um, and, and based on the provenance of that particular piece of fruit, it's, it's wacky. Like, the, 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 Oh, it's unreal. I mean, the thing that Jim used to do that blew my mind is he would schedule, um, patio shifts and he would actually have the weather forecast update into the Google sheet. And if it was supposed to rain, you didn't come into work. And it was something that was just pulled from a live source online. So there's so much power to having it live on the web. Wow. Yeah, we. It, it, I mean, when you stop to think about how where we were like 20 years ago, um, and where we are now, um, you know, like your ability to put together an entire operations, you know, budget projection with the app on your phone, it's just madness to me. Um, now, oh, absolutely. Uh, like knowing what you know and and having and and being engaged with, um, especially with teaching modern technique in a recurring way. What do you think the future of bars and restaurants is going to be in five, ten years with the gig and, and uh, convenience economies? Oh, uh, it's it's a scary thought, but I think we're going we're going some elevated version of fast casual, just with how a lot of the labor laws and a lot of just the environment around it is going. Um, and I think like even even to your point in the efforts that you're putting in now, there's definitely two sides of a coin where like, you know, f- for longer than it's currently been, you know, people being analog and pen and paper, you know, the opportunity to get as granular as you want and figure out, you know, what that eight grams of salt in your simple syrup actually costs you. Um I think it's going to start to come down to like what information really matters and where the efforts are really valuable to put in because there's so much available and there's so much you can do uh, that I think like with cocktails where, you know, we went from old fashions and daiquiris to 15 ingredient tiki drinks and, you know, 20 ingredient canceling each other out back down to three, four, five ingredient, you know, that refinement in the systems is kind of what I think is going to be coming in the next couple of years. There's so much available and so much that can be done right now. Um, and I think, you know, like with cocktails, like with food, like with everything, that expansion and kind of showcasing of what is possible when it's followed by that refinement of what's practical and what makes sense. I think that puts us in a really beautiful place and I'm very excited to see, you know, when the dust settles, what actually has held value and what is actually being utilized. Yeah. I'm just, I mean, just wondering and pondering what's going to happen in the future. Like as far as like ghost kitchens and and all those kind of things, it's like, it's a really terrifying thing as far as like operationally. Yes. We're going to get more and more, like it's going to get easier and easier and easier. I mean, there's going to be software products that basically manage your, your, your bar for you um, as if there weren't already right now. But um, you know, I'm just curious, like what you think, like the future of bartending is um, especially in, uh, I mean, you know, you kind of made reference to this, but New York city is like, you know, almost actively hostile to, towards small business. And it's really hard to open up a bar. It's, you know, it's when you do open, it's regulated. If you, if you do get open, um, you can probably, you know, I know somebody who's waiting to open up his bar in Long Island city. He's been waiting for two months. Um, and it's a problem that was solved with a trip to the hardware store. And he has to wait two months for a national rent to, to go and reinspect oh, it. And meanwhile, he's sitting, he's, meanwhile, he's sitting on a perfectly functional turnkey um, compliant restaurant, except for that one thing. And he has to wait. Yep. No, it is. And I think it's in large part why there's an exodus from New York. Um, but I do think that a lot of it is going to go the way of ghost kitchens because people aren't eating out as often. And I mean, it's a project that I've looked into on my own as well. Um, but I think ghost kitchens are going to be a thing as early as a year and a half ago, I was taking meetings, um, kind of gearing up for some of the new things coming into New York where restaurants were looking to remove the bar and integrate a cocktail program back a house or bars were looking to, you know, remove the service side of things and find a way for bartenders to activate the, you know, the floor side or the food side, um, so I think there is definitely 
a shift coming, at least in in the major markets. Um, you know, I think some of the smaller markets are providing an opportunity for people to uh, to structure differently. But you know, taking those meetings was a big eye opener in actively structuring bars to remove one of the two elements just to tighten everything up. Yeah, man, it's crazy. The the craziest days are ahead of us, I think. For sure, and it's definitely going to be the biggest shift that we've seen in a long time. Yeah, I feel like there, I feel like there's like a big monumental thing about to happen, and um, and it's like like this is in a culture of like these big celebrity chefs that are no longer relevant on TV, and this is kind of in reference to the eater power issue. But it's like they're like the the bigger TV chefs are kind of no longer relevant. Or, you know, it's just like, the, it seems like there is a different shift in focus into, into dining and, and, um, and it's like either into this large industrial space, like of a, of a, of a ghost kitchen where there are no actual seats, um, which I think is wildly intelligent. And I still credit you in my mind for, for coming up with that idea. Um, but then like you can't all, but you also can't open up a 55 seat restaurant because you're, you're taxed out of business or fined out of business. Like you have to, you have to choose whether you're profitable or compliant. And it really is that bad out there. I mean, it's like, it's not, you know, people think that, oh, wow, you can, you know, open up a bar, you're going to make a ton of money. Like, cause you're getting what? $15 for a drink that costs you a dollar. Um, all that money goes into dumb shit, like paying fines for a poster that you put up or like, yeah, or didn't put up or didn't put up or, you know, getting the wrong letter grade or just not knowing how to market your business or like, you know, or just not following some dumb shit rule. And so it's like, you know, the owners of bars and restaurants are like chief compliance officers. They're not like restaurateurs and they, they don't have time to like go and greet every table like they used to. Um, so it's, it's just frustrating for me. Cause like I, you know, I grew up in, in small bars just like you did. And, um, and you just, you know, hate to see these people, you know, spend their life savings on a bar and only to find out that they can't possibly be successful sometimes. And I think that's the thing too. Like we're looking at, you know, we're looking at the small markets being the ones that are about to inherit passionate people and the larger markets are going to be the ones that are, you know, about to turn into big food courts where it's, you know, the personality is kind of taken out and it's built for efficiency and it's built for, you know, turn and burn and a lot of that, a lot of that touch point and a lot of that, you know, relationship and engagement is going to not be commonplace anymore. You're going to have to actively pursue doing that. And it, it's kind of, you know, it's upsetting to see it go that way, but I hope that there's solutions to do it. And, you know, and some of it, it's definitely going to be leaning out the staff to open up the opportunities to maintain that. And in other cases, it might just be, you know, totally restructuring. Or if you thought you wanted a restaurant, you're just going to have a bar with snacks. Or if you wanted a restaurant, you're going to have, you know, bottled cocktails. Um, but there's definitely going to be sacrifices and concessions made to, what people's original plans were for sure. So I, I was asking Naran about this the other day when I was at Dante. Um, and I asked him like, what is it? How did you find these people that are just bubbly and cheerful and wonderful? Like, how do you find that? Or how do you train that? How, what, what do you look for when you're hiring people? Um, I mean, passion goes a long way, but I think a lot of it too. And, you know, in opening restaurants, you kind of have that over hire because you don't know what to expect and then kind of boil down to what's needed. And then you, you know, you adjust on the fly as you get going. Um, but I think a lot of it is the culture that you create. You know, a lot of it is doing things sensibly or valuing the opinion of who's coming on board and, you know, the understanding of that you can learn from everybody, you know, you need to guide the ship and you need to make your decisions. But I think that inclusion of everything, because people are learning faster, they are coming with their own ideas. Um, they're coming on board wanting to do more. And the more that you stifle that or the more that you try and, you know, really pigeonhole someone into this is what you do and this is what I need you to do. Like you need to give people the opportunity to be themselves and be creative because in this gig economy and in this world of, you know, smaller business and solopreneurs and stuff like that, people are actively pursuing other things. And a lot of these restaurants and a lot of these bars are just, platforms for people to kind of jump off from. But yeah, I think a lot of it is just, you know, cultivating eager bodies and giving them opportunities, even if it's little things here or there, or just sitting down and listening to, you know, to their creative process or their thoughts or getting feedback or insight from the staff and from the new hires and from your employees. 
um, and really kind of, you know, cultivating, a, you know, or just having a culture where those other opinions are valued because it'll keep people interested in growing that program instead of spitefully coming in and just, you know, doing their job to get their check and going home. Totally. I totally agree with you. I, I can't like at the, the academy, I'm just like, any opportunity I get to, to sit down with somebody and say, Hey, this is how I do this. I'm like, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to like one, create um, a mentor mentee relationship. And two, I'm trying to create an added value in the job that's beyond money. Cause I feel like if there's uh, an important value, an intrinsic value, um, a career long value that you're providing, that's much more than exchanging time for money. Then, you know, that's, maybe somebody will think twice before they, um, you know, quit their job or before they do something stupid or before they come in late. Um, and I think that it's just not enough to say, this is how you do your job. You do your job. You here's your money. And then you go home. Um, uh, although that is one of my favorite things about Tenny bar though, was, was that I could just forget about it right after I left. That, that part was great. Uh, the- <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, there's value in short term memory when it comes to you know, when it comes to being over the bar from the guest side of things. But I think, you know, going into the expansion of what the industry is doing now, that mentor situation that's there, you can learn from anybody. I mean, the amount of things I've learned from the new guy that came in because they did something at their last place differently, it doesn't make it bad. It makes it different. Like I've seen, I've seen solutions fix problems. I've seen the same solutions not work other places. Like everything is so unique and so individual to, you know, to the establishment and the problem and that specific set of circumstances that, you know, there's a hundred right answers to a problem. There's a hundred wrong answers to the problem. And that problem is the moving part. Like it's really, really cool to see who you can learn from and where that knowledge can come from or where they picked it up. And, you know, you just never know where that's going to come from. Yeah. And, and, and anybody who doesn't love problems is like probably, probably going to eventually be one themselves. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's just they, like, like problems are, are really fun to solve once. Um, and you know, like, having like finding people that are, that are kind of like-minded in that respect, I think is, is also very important. Um, all right, man. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, I, I know you probably are pretty crushed since coming back from vacation, but, um, oh my God, you took a vacation. That's awesome. That's crazy. How does that even happen? I know. <laughs> Uh, it, it took a lot of discipline to just book it and literally sit on my hands for 24 hours. So I couldn't return the ticket. That's so great. That's so great. Good for you. Thank you. All right, man. Well, um, well, thank you so much for being on the show and, um, I'm sure we will talk very soon. And, you know, we, like I pretty much can't resist bouncing ideas off of you, um, all the time. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, buddy. Sounds good. Be sure to check out Chris Bidmead on the interwebs. His Instagram handle is at It's Bidmead. To check out Bar Methods, be sure to apply by September 2nd. That's when the deadline is. Um, You can find that at Bar Methods on Instagram and Twitter or search for Bar Methods on Facebook. But the best way is to either uh, check out the website, barmethods.com, B-A-R-M-E-T-H-O-D-S.com or info at barmethods.com if you want to find some more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode chatting with Chris Bidney from Bar Methods um, about organizational methodologies, some strategies, and um, some techniques. Be sure to check out the show notes for a brief summary of the show and to link to anything that we talked about, um, especially Bar Methods. The application is open until September 2nd. Head to barmethods.com for that. Um, I want to keep these shows super short and super dense. Uh, if you have any thoughts, questions, or ideas, please be sure to reach out to me at Jason Latrell on Twitter and Instagram or search for Jason Latrell on Facebook and LinkedIn. I'm quite active on all those platforms. Um, I'm even on TikTok. TikTok is amazing. So if you got anything out of our time together, you can thank me by simply sharing this with another person. If you love the show, please hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review or a comment. Uh, You would be amazed how much that affects the algorithm. It's actually a big deal. But thank you so much for checking out The Little Trail Show. Um, I hope to see you next time.